jumping back into our series that we've been been on for for a while. This is our um, I think it's our fourth or yes, our fourth installment of this, but it's been broken up and I kind of like that it's been broken up because some of this you just need some time to chew on and today um, ushers um, you may want to stand by the doors to let people out as they get offended and want to leave and so I'm just going to say that right now so um, can I tell you that Sometimes preaching the word of God for the word of God is one of the hardest things to do because you know that there's going to be some people who aren't going to clearly understand what you're saying and they're going to form an opinion about you and about Jesus based on the limited amount of time that you had to say what you said. But here is one thing that I'm telling you about today's message. I believe it is 100% true according to the word of God. Regardless of what society wants to tell us right now. Regardless of other things that are happening right now throughout the world. That what I'm sharing today is truth. Parents, if you've got kids in the room today, um... They might have questions on the way home, and that's not such a bad thing. My hope is that some things I'm going to mention today, you have already spoke about with your children. We know that most of them in here are teenagers. They're sixth grade or older, and so hopefully you have had some of these conversations. If not, get ready for it, and if after service you're like, thanks a lot, Pastor Bill. Be the parent God has called you to be and have the conversation. Regardless of what society says, the Bible is clear on what is sexual sin. Like, oh, he's talking about sex in church. What do I mean by sexual sin? Any form of sex, sexuality, outside of marriage between one man and one woman. If it's before marriage, it's a sin. If you're married and having sex with someone else, definitely a sin. Most people don't have to be told about that one. Pornography, sin. Hope you can keep up today. I do want to encourage you that on Wednesday night, we're going to continue this conversation. That's what our Wednesday night has been called recently, is continuing the conversation. We got to understand that God's word and his discipline reflect his love for us. Discipline is a form of love when it's done in the right heart and in the right way. I, as a child, had a stepfather who, I'll use a better word, who was a tool and he physically lost his temper and physically abused me as a child. That's not discipline. God doesn't work like that. God's discipline, it comes, it doesn't change, it always remains true. If it was wrong yesterday, it's wrong today. If it was wrong 2,000 years ago, it's still wrong today. It's not going to change. Jesus came to heal our brokenness, church. And the fact is, is that everyone in this room, because of sin, we have some sort of brokenness in our life that we're dealing with, that we're sorting out, that we're walking through. 
But from the beginning, God appointed one man and one woman for the purpose of creation. From the very beginning, Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. God designed sex to be pleasurable but for marriage. You guys are like, wow, what? This is a big elephant in this room. <laughs> Society has taken sexual purity and made it seem outdated. Almost making those who choose that route as an outcast or as some weirdo or as someone that isn't a real man or a real woman. But God's word is true. Any sex in any form before or outside of marriage is a perversion of God's design. And just to let you know where I am on this, before my wife and I got married, we were living together. You can put the pieces together. We had a pastor that loved us enough to say, hey, what you're doing is sinful, it is wrong. If you want me to officiate your wedding, you will abstain until your wedding night. So what I'm telling you today, I had a pastor who loved Amy and I enough just over 20 years ago tell us what I'm sharing today. April 6th, we will celebrate 20 years of marriage. Yeah. What's up, girl? What's God's word say? A lot. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Sanctified means set apart from the rest of the world, set apart for me. So that's what sanctified means. That's a word that we use in church. We don't really use it in corporate meetings or other types of things. You're not, probably not talking about sanctification in your break room, wherever you work. Okay, so that's what that means. That you, you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans, but, or, or sorry, like, like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his holy spirit. Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica. He's writing to the church, to the people in the church, to the people who are supposed to be experiencing sanctification. But he knows that there's some things happening that shouldn't be happening, and so he finds himself in a similar situation that I find myself in this world. Understand that I risk today hate speech because someone will take something I say and twist it. But at that risk, I have to preach God's word. I've got it easy compared to some of my brothers and sisters in other countries that can't even be found with the Bible without punishment of jail or death. Sanctification, um, translated purified, made holy, consecrated unto God. The first thing in that list for sanctification was sexual impurity. The first thing, the very first thing in that list, talked about sexual purity. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself 
through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I thank God that he is still God of reconciliation, church. That he takes marriages and he reconciles them back together. That he takes broken families and he brings reconciliation. That he takes us who are far from him and reconciles us back to him. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. That does not mean that we're not going to be held in judgment at judgment time for our sin, but that regardless of what we've done, we can still, through Christ, be reconciled to God regardless of the sin we have. And he has committed us to this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Please, church, have the attitude where you want to pursue being righteous more than you want to pursue being right. Please have that attitude. There's a difference. We can't be new and remain in the old. We can't be new and remain in the old. If you're going to have your prized possession of a car restored and refurbished, you don't want the guy to go and do everything on the outside but leave the inside as it is. You're like, hey, I wanted this whole car to be made new. We think that happens with us, that we start wearing some New Life Assembly shirts and we start coming to church on Sunday morning and that, oh, look at this new creation, but inside nothing's changed. Our old nature must die. Impurities must go with it. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You do not live in faith if you are still in control. I don't think anybody heard that. You don't live in faith if you're still in control. If you're still in control, you are not living in faith. This next one is going to hit some people really hard. But show me scripture that tells me I'm wrong. If there's no evidence of sanctification, there really wasn't an experience of salvation. Your prayer didn't make you saved. You say, well, I, I mean, I prayed the prayer, so there you go. But God knows your heart, and he knows how you're going to live your life. And he says, praying the prayer is one thing, but now you've got to become sanctified. Now you've got to become set apart. Now you've got to become different. If there's no evidence of sanctification, there never really was a salvation experience. 1 Thessalonians talked about the necessity of controlling our bodies. When people stay in, when they stay, when they choose to stay in sin, in any sin, when they choose to stay in sin, when they choose to stay in sexual sin, it shows, it shows, it presents itself, it's evidence that the Holy Spirit is not present. If you're going to stay in sin... And have no heart of wanting to change. No desire of repentance. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Show me your fruit, I'll show you your faith. You lack self-control, you don't have much faith. We have to understand that God's word is designed so that our life fits into what God's word already says, not the other way around. Not that we want to take God's word and try to make it fit our life so that it makes us feel better and makes our group feel better and make the rest of our people that agree with us feel better. No, here it is. Make your life be shaped by the word of God, not the other way around. That's not how it works. 
1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. I'm giving you a lot of scripture so that you know this is God's word. This is God's word. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous. Those without a true faith experience. The unrighteous. Those without self-control. The unrighteous. Those with no evidence of sanctification. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. The deceiver is Satan. And he's on the prowl. And he wants to deceive us. He wants to trip us up. He wants us to, to just kind of feel better about ourselves. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't stop there. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 20. Flee, run, get away, stay as far as away as you can from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. You can't call this the temple of Christ if you're sinning against your own body. Mm. Not going to find that on a bumper sticker, are you? Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. When followers of Christ remain sexually pure, they honor God. They honor God. Today's elephant in the room, sexual sin, sexuality, and gender. When it comes to this, to these next few thoughts, let me tell you that there are some messages out there that are shared, spoken, delivered from God to men and women of God that need no sort of other interpretation, need no work, need no nothing with it. And I came across a message from John Lindell, pastor of James River Church in Springfield. Can I tell you this? Stop with this attitude that, oh, bigger the church, less gospel. Bigger the church, less message. Bigger the church, they water it down. That's a lie of the enemy to bring division. It's a lie of the enemy to bring division. James River is an Assemblies of God church in the Springfield area. Pastor John Lindell is a solid minister of the gospel of Christ and represents the Assemblies of God well. Some of what I'm going to share today spoke, spoke to me, and I, I want to bring it to you. Also, you're not praying and seeking God for your own word. Zip it. <laughs> you don't say that to me at Christmas. Yeah, you know what I mean. The Mayo Clinic website defines gender dysphoria, also known as gender identity. You're like, whoa, pastor, you're going there today? Absolutely. Gender dysphoria is the feeling of discomfort or distress that might occur in people whose gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth or sex-related physical characteristics. Among teenagers, mental health Issues increase when it comes to gender dysphoria and gender identity amongst themselves or amongst their peer groups. If you're a teenager today, listen to what I say. If you're a parent of a teenager today, listen to what I say. The rest of us, let's listen so that we can be there to help those who need truth. As their mental health increases, or their mental health issues increase, we see things like cutting, eating disorders, ADHD on the increase, bipolar, and other mental aspects. Understand, church, mental health is a serious issue. Go back to the first Elephant in the Room series online and check it out. 
It is a major issue. Too often, when teenagers are taken to gender therapists or physicians, they're not encouraged to explore their mental health issues or their mental health situations. They're oftentimes told to, to begin the transition that they want to transition. They're oftentimes told that. There are stats galore on the impact of gender dysphoria, gender identity, and there are stats galore out there. Stats change. The word of God does not. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all creation that moves along the ground. So God created mankind in his image, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. The words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, haven't you heard? Read at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Male, female. God created it. God's the ultimate creator. Two genders. Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear women's clothing for the Lord your God to test anyone who does this. Now understand this, he says some of you straight in this scripture, this has nothing to do with the women wearing pants, it has nothing to do with that. You've got to look at the whole scripture in context, you have to look at what was going on with them at that time. This is about Someone presenting themselves as the opposite sex. That's what it is about. So if you're holier than thou, you need set free. It's clear. God said, hey, do not present yourself as the opposite sex. Galatians 3, 26 and 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all in, for you are all one in Christ. Now, there's people on the other side that are like, aha, see? Jesus, Jesus took away what God did. Crazy. It's craziness. In Christ... We are together as one with one another. It does not erase our differences. Being in Christ doesn't erase biology. It doesn't take away anatomy. It doesn't take away gender. It doesn't take away color. It doesn't take away race. It says because of all of that, you can all come together as one so that no one thinks they are better than or Sorry, so that no one really is better than anyone else. Because how many of you know that there are some people that think they're better than other people? Because their skin's a little different. Or because their lifestyle's a little different. Or something else. Whoo, Jesus. I hope I make it to my five-year goal. (laughs) Church, you know my five-year goal, right? What is it? Amy knows, don't get fired. So let's talk about people. As we lay down some scripture, let's begin to talk about real world application. Let's talk about people, especially children, especially teenagers. Let's have some real talk for a moment. What about, what about girls who like trucks more than Barbie dolls? What about girls who would rather join MMA than to go join some other girls' group? What about boys who aren't 
really so into major masculine aggression. Raw. <laughs> and what, what about the boys who would prefer gymnastics over football? Real talk. Real talk, church. Many of you are probably thinking to yourself that you know a boy, girl, man, lady that you've had this conversation with because maybe they find themselves there. Can I just say that for children, it's part of growing up. Mm, I don't think everybody agrees with me, but that's okay. It's part of growing up. It's not necessarily gender dysphoria. It is not necessarily gender identity. I tell you what oftentimes makes it that is you make a big deal about it. You make a big deal about it. Let's begin to affirm people for who they are, not what they are do let's affirm people for who they are not necessarily for what they do I want to say this that if you are or you know someone struggling with anything that I'm talking about today sexual sin gender dysphoria Dressing different, maybe transitioning. If you're watching online, God loves you. God loves you. God loves that person that you know that they're struggling with these things. God loves them. God loves them. In this church, you matter. Listen, church, we cannot pick and choose the things we support. We can't have this awesome testimony of supporting Joel through his struggles and someone else comes in with a struggle like this or somewhere in this ballpark. And we're like, no, we're not doing that struggle. Mm-mm, that's nasty. <laughs> You're the problem if that's your attitude. Yeah. Someone started clapping and like, oh, nobody else is clapping, so I'll stop, but that's okay. <laughs> Can I tell you that while God loves you, while this church loves you, while you matter, society is lying to you. Society is lying to you. Society is trying to trick you. Satan is at work today. I want to let you know that as a pastor, as a man of God, I can love you and accept you as a person without affirming your decisions because guess what your decisions don't make who you are I can love you and I can affirm you for the person that you are and still disagree with the decisions that you make or the lifestyle that you live the world needs to hear more of this they need to hear that there's places and there's people who love People. Reach people where they are. What if they're in transition? What if they're struggling? Am I a man? Am I a woman? What if they're addicted to sex? What if they've got four kids and never been married? Do we choose where we reach them or do we reach them where they are? I can still affirm the value of a person and remain committed to the truth of God's word. I can do that and I'll continue to do that. And when I stop, I no longer need to do what I'm doing. Prescribing drugs or stopping puberty doesn't help kids struggling with identity. Stats show that those types of things, encouraging or advising transition with children and teenagers, increases their risk of suicide. 
So what should parents do? What should a church family do? And this is specifically, I'm not going to mess with what Pastor John Lindell said. Nothing else. Number one, be informed. Parents, you need to be informed. Teenagers, you need to be informed. Church family, we need to be informed. But let me talk to the parents in the room for a minute. You better be informed in what your kids see. You better be informed for what is on their phone. Okay? It wasn't until Will's, Will turned 18 and about four weeks or so after that said, hey, Dad, can you take off the parental controls on my phone? I had a decision to make. God, have I raised this now a man to be a man of integrity, to, not, to no longer be my little boy, although last night he tried to buck up to his old man, <laughs> got pinned. He wouldn't give me a hug when he was leaving. I got my hug. So I did. I took off the parental controls. But I've still got his Instagram password. <laughs> My kids have never been allowed to set their own passcode on their phone. Parents, can I tell you this? There is no obligation as a parent to respect your child's privacy. And no obligation for that. At the same time... Be part of the process that breeds success. Give them some room, listen, give them some room to mess up. Not too bad. Give them some room to mess up. You can ask my kids. My kids, their phone gets plugged into our entryway table on a school night at 8.30, unless they're working on a weekend at 9.30. Yeah, but, yeah, but Pastor, my kids use their phone for an alarm so that they can wake up. Cuckoo, cuckoo. There's this thing called an alarm clock. Okay. Be part of the selection process of friends for your kids. And by the way, you ain't supposed to be one of their friends. Be wise about it. But be part of the process selection for their friends. My friends, know, my friends, my kids know that when they bring a friend over to the house to kind of break the ice, let me ask them, what is one question that I ask your friends when they come to the house and I meet them for the first time? Georgia, what'd you say? Do you smoke weed? <laughs> Will said he doesn't bring friends to the house. <laughs> That's actually not too far off from the truth. And then Ryan said, after their friends have been there a while, walk in, be like, did you bring your rent money? But here's the one thing I know. Men, you have an opportunity to be a father figure to your children's friends that they may not have. Women, you have an opportunity to be a mother figure to those children's friends that they may not have. Be wise about it. Secondly, be involved. Know where they are. Know what they're doing. If you're a parent and your kid has a smartphone, whether they drive or not, and you do not have Life 360 on their phone, you're crazy. Be involved. Be involved to the point that when is the best time to talk with them? 
when is the best time to, I've noticed that as they've gotten older, that time to talk with them has gotten later. And that's okay. That's where my kids are now. At one time, it was maybe we would talk before school on a ride home to school. Now that tends to be later on, okay? Sometimes we don't even know they're there. We check Life 360. Oh, they got home. Be involved. Where are they? Who are they with? What's the best time to talk to them about situations and about circumstances? And number three, be in charge. Don't be a bully. Don't be a jerk. But be in charge. Be in charge. I need to take a drink for this next one. <laughs> Amy says, just water. <laughs> I preached on alcohol a few weeks ago. If you, as a parent or anything, if you have to remind people that you're in charge, you're not in charge. Okay, make sure your kids know that you're the boss, that you're in charge. Parents, be the mature ones. Teens, preteens, you and your peers and those teens and those preteens watching online, you are not ready for decisions on gender identity. You do not have the maturity and the capacity to process what all of that means. Students, listen to the wisdom that other people are telling you when it comes to these issues. Parents, if someone else talks to your child about sex, sexuality, gender before you, you're doing it wrong. Now, I'm not saying sit your four-year-old down and go, go into details. That's all I'm saying, okay? There's not a whole lot about the birds and the bees that my kids don't know. If someone else is talking to your kids first, you're losing the fight. If the church isn't talking about these things first, we're losing the fight to society. I want to show a video here of, now listen, let your views on TikTok be your views, and let my views on TikTok be my views. There's a TikToker out there named Ariana Armour. And I came across a testimony first on YouTube, found it on TikTok, started watching some of the videos. Ariana was a 16-year lesbian. The last two years was female-to-male transition. Her church met her where she was during transition. What you're going to hear on this video is a vision that God gave her. Now, she is going to sound like a he. She was into the total, total transition. James Harley was the name that when she began the transition that, that she went by. But this is amazing as to what God showed her her that now is on TikTok, that now is on YouTube. Listen, I know there's bad stuff out there. I'm not denying that. But God can make all things work for good. When they got testimony and they've got this platform called TikTok to share it, whew. By the way, 
I have permission to show this video. I messaged her on TikTok to get permission because these things matter to me, doing things the right way. And so I want you to hear from Ariana or more about what God showed her as a transgender from female to male. I love your question and I thank you for raising it. So I truly gave my life to Jesus and surrendered everything completely to follow him, I think in around September of 2021. So at this point, I had been a trans man for around two years and I was planning to get engaged and I was praying in my prayer closet one day and God spoke to me and he gave me a vision. In this vision, there was a man and a woman holding hands on one side. On the other side, there was a man and a man and a woman and a woman. They were all couples. There was a line dividing them. The man and the woman had generations going down. The man and the man and the woman and the woman, there was a red line under their feet and it was black because we all know you can't recreate life that way. So I was staring at this vision in front of my face and all of a sudden God speaks to me and he says, I made man and woman so you could recreate and share the good news of my son, Jesus Christ. And I said, yeah, I heard that my whole life. Tell me something I don't know. And God was like, stop talking and listen. And I was like, oop, okay, my bad. He continues to say, if the devil can convince somebody, a little boy or a little girl, that they are gay, lesbian, trans, or that they are trapped in the wrong body, he said, not only is the devil going against my will, because the devil's will is always against God's will but the devil is wiping out entire family bloodlines and generations of people that I intended to be born will not exist for my glory. So I was thinking to myself, okay, how many people are not walking this earth right now because of the choices that we make? For example, people always be like, oh God, why don't you end cancer? Why don't you end world hunger? Why don't you stop racism and violence? And God's sitting up here like, yo, I've been trying to send the person who's going to invent the cure for cancer, but they don't exist yet because the people who were supposed to create them chose to live a different lifestyle. So I was just thinking, you know, how many people don't exist right now that should exist because the people who were supposed to create them chose to live another life outside of God's plan for them? Then God said, if you continue to go down this road, you will not meet the man that I designed for you and you will not have the kids you're supposed to have. So I was thinking to myself, okay, God, you say you've designed a man for me. He's meant for me and I'm meant for him. I was thinking about my husband and I was like, okay, what is his life going to be like without me in it? We're designed for each other. And as a husband and wife, we have a goal, a mission that God wants us to complete while we're here on the earth. But if I keep living a homosexual lifestyle, I won't meet that man and we can't complete our assignment by God. Then I thought about my kids and I was like, okay, my kids have a purpose too. God wants to create them for something. But if I don't meet that man, we won't create those kids and they can't do whatever God has created them to do because they won't exist because I keep living a homosexual lifestyle. So I sat there and I was crying and I was like, man, I've been so selfish my whole life what I want, when I want it, who I want it with, how I feel, me, me, me. And God wrapped this fiery blanket around me and he said, I love you no matter what you choose, but you have to choose today. Long story short, I chose Jesus. If you don't think that she is reaching people with the truth that God is speaking through her. You're too religious. Yeah. And you're the problem with the church today. There's more to her story. There's a 50 minute video of her entire testimony. But I'm thankful for that church that met her where she was at that time she would have wanted to be called him I'm thankful for the truth that was preached at that church while she was there and I'm thankful that she's allowed me to show this video one that can't be shown necessarily in every single church in her region. There was no cuss words in this one, though. If you were in the meeting yesterday, you can laugh about that. 
I showed the wrong video in a meeting yesterday. I had about three cuss words in the first 20 seconds. I'm like, wrong one. I'm glad that, that people in that meeting is sending grace to me. This is a real issue, church. These are real people. These are people that God created for a purpose, and the enemy is trying to steal that purpose. You heard it from her about how bloodlines have been wiped out because of sexual sin, sexuality, and gender issues. So what can we do as a church? First, we should want to grow in Christ. We should want to grow in this. We should pray, God, help me that if I'm having a conversation with someone, that I sound like someone that loves them and I don't sound like a religious bigot. We need to pray for our kids. We need to pray for parents. We need to pray for society. We need to pray for revival. We've got to continue to love people. We've got to continue to choose grace and choose kindness. We've got to stand up for truth. We've got to stand up for what the Bible says and not be afraid of it, even if it's unpopular. I ask this. Be the Jesus that people need. And let's be a church that is here for people regardless of what struggle they bring in. Regardless of what they're struggling with, what they're trying to sort out and what they're trying to find out. Let's be a church that says, okay, that's who you are coming in. But God's got something bigger and better for you while you're here. And we're going to be a church that's going to help you to walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be as a person of God set free from sexual sin and the things that come with it. But we got to be willing to walk through the process too. In her faith journey that that vision was approximately 14 months or so from when she first and there's other ones where she talks about by the way when I went to the church and was going to the church and was continuing to live in this she tells people I wasn't really saved it's powerful she's walking in this journey for about 14 months and God finally opened her eyes to truth but she had some people there walking with her I get it that some of you have already made up your mind. I'm not responding to that altar call today. Don't worry. I'm not necessarily going to have a traditional altar call today. I'm going to give you a charge to be who I've just shared the Bible expects us to be to other people. That's your challenge. That's your challenge. If you know someone in this, pick up the phone this afternoon or in a few days after you see that it posts on YouTube, that the full sermon posts, and send them the link and say, hey, I don't know what you're used to hearing, but listen to what my pastor said. Forget everything else that you've heard about other churches because many of people in sexual sin, sexuality, gender issues and things have already written off pastors and churches a long time ago. Pass it on to them if you have that relationship with them. Also be okay if they don't receive the message because the enemy is really good at what he does. I know God is better, but the enemy is good too. So if they don't receive the message, keep praying, keep believing, keep fasting, keep telling them about Jesus. Jesus.